Right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back from lunch and socializing and networking and stacking. Uh, my name is Mark Shuttleworth. I am the founder of both Ubuntu and Canonical. Uh, and I currently lead uh, products for Canonical, uh, which spans both our cloud work, uh, public, private, uh, and our edge or IoT work, which is um, equally entertaining and interesting, but not the focus today. Um, how many folks here have been to a presentation by me or Canonical generally before at an OpenStack Summit? Great, lots of new folks. Uh, what we like to do is to focus on, on actual operations of actual OpenStack in these kinds of contexts, right? Um, in a time of disruption, in a time of uncertainty, you tend to have what we call the fog of disruption, right? Lots of people shouting out about lots of opinions about uh, you know, what, what's important in this new world, right? That's partly what makes the new world exciting is because the book isn't yet written, right? We're all trying to figure out you know, what's gonna work, what's not, what's the right way to do things, what's not. And of course, everybody's opinion is equally you know, valid in a sense. Uh, and there are a lot of people here at a summit like this with a lot of opinions, right? Um, but I, if I look at what we do, I think it, it, it really focuses on asking the simple question, what really matters and what really matters in the long term? Which is not to say that things aren't different. You know, operating in a cloud way is very, very different to operating before cloud. Uh, they're both important, you know, both enterprise class stories, right? But what really mattered changed fundamentally between people who, who were running enterprise operations before the cloud and now in a world where people are running enterprise operations with the cloud, right? And we're going into another one of those phases of uncertainty and disruption and opinion fests, uh, which you can probably call containers, right? Um, and just as with cloud, you know, containers have actually been around a while. Um, but because they have lit a fire under people's imagination, they are a source of lots of opinions and lots of opinion fests and lots of disputes and arguments and Twitter fights, right, about, you know, how it's going to work. Uh, in that complicated world of containers, uh, Kubernetes is really catching people's attention at the moment. Uh, I think folks will come to understand Kubernetes as one very important part of a broader story, just like OpenStack is one very important part of a broader story, right? Uh, there was a time when people said the whole data center will be OpenStack and that's the end of the conversation. We didn't think that. And now it turns out that OpenStack is an important part of the data center. It's never gonna be the whole data center and that's okay, right? That's just fine, OpenStack will do just great doing the things that OpenStack is just great at, right? What I wanna to talk today about is to zoom in a little bit on just the question of Kubernetes and OpenStack and Kubernetes across other clouds, a hybrid cloud question. Uh, but I'm gonna start, as always, with, with this set of questions, right? Like, what really matters, right? What really matters? Um, and I'm gonna put up what I, what I hope will be um, some useful ways to think about the choices that people have to make as they're getting into Kubernetes, right? And the same would apply if you're looking at other kinds of containers, but let's kind of focus on, uh, on Kubernetes itself. Well, I'd say the most important thing is to maintain the freedom to choose infrastructure independent of your choice of Kubernetes. Why, why would I say that? Well, because Kubernetes, like other what we call process containers, right? So there, you'll find there's lots of different kinds of containers and it's much easier actually if you give them each a name because then two people can have a conversation and not be talking past each other, right? But there's a class of containers where inside the container you really care about a single process and you really care about that process, you know, coming from a developer that you trust and so essentially that container is, you can think of it like an app, but it's really a it's only an app in the cloud sense of apps, right? Like Gmail is an app, right? But yes, inside Gmail, there are a bunch of processes and those processes are probably running alone 
in a little container, what we would call a process container. So Docker is an example of a process container. Um, and Rocket, you'll have heard about Rocket, that's an example of a process container. Run C, these are ways to sort of set up a process container. Well, those constructs are completely separate from machines. I can run Docker on Amazon, I can run Docker on VMware, I can run Docker on bare metal, I can run Docker on you know, any place I can get a machine, right? I can, so I can have a CentOS machine and I can run Docker on it. I can have a, an Ubuntu machine, I can run Docker on it. So the first and most important thing actually is to separate the question of where am I going to run Docker stuff, these process containers, from the infrastructure. Because if you end up in a situation where you can only do Kubernetes you know, on VMware because that's where you built it, now you have a really big problem. You can't, you can't essentially give your developers the freedom to go fast and yourself the freedom to then put that developer stuff on AWS or on Azure or on Google, right? And as a business owner, the ultimate buyers effectively, the CIOs, they really want the freedom to put stuff on a public cloud like Azure or a private infrastructure like VMware or OpenStack. Right? So the first thing really is to deconflict these two choices, infrastructure, machine choices, from process container app type choices. Now, of course, you know, free speech and lots of opinions. So right here, there'll be, you'll find furious arguments about how, how OpenStack should change to get a set of APIs which will provide you OpenStack in 80s, right, or various permutations of that. And honestly, that's just a waste of time because from a CIO's perspective, having a different set of APIs on OpenStack to get a Kubernetes doesn't make sense in a world where you don't know if you want to put a particular app on a public cloud or on a private infrastructure. So no VMware-specific Kubernetes APIs really are going to get much traction. No public cloud-specific capabilities, if they're exclusionary, are really going to get much traction because we have to decouple what developers do from infrastructure choice. Right? Infrastructure choice is really an economic choice. Right? Do I want to rent? Do I want to buy? Do I want to rent in Germany? Do I want to buy in San Francisco? These are reasonable economic choices for businesses to make. You've got to separate those out from developer choices. Right? There's another reason to do this, which is that essentially um, uh, Kubernetes, like Docker, like um, uh, Mesos and so on, uh, are fast moving pieces of infrastructure. And we probably want to think about those as project level constructs, right? So the other reason to do this is that you essentially allow two different teams to make different choices. It would be perfectly reasonable for a business to essentially say that project over there, that project we're going to go run that on Azure, this project we're going to run on OpenStack, and that project we're going to run on VMware. You might disagree with the choice of technologies, but at the end of the day, those are reasonable choices for businesses to make at the same time. Right? Large businesses do lots of things that are at odds with each other at the same time, that's okay. Um, so separating these choices really allows, allows the business the flexibility economically, and it also allows developers the flexibility at a, at a project level to essentially do different things in different places. What we have to do is, is make that freedom not cost too much. Right? It has to be really easy, essentially, for the business to own and operate these different Kubernetes on different clouds or different substrates. Um, separating the operations of Kubernetes from the operations of OpenStack or the operations of Kubernetes from the operations of your public cloud, those are good ways to make things easy, right? Because you kind of concentrate your mind on the, the key thing that matters. But like all sharp swords that has two edges, Kubernetes is a layer um, essentially for coordinating Docker processes, applications, and those applications typically are cloud-native applications, which means that they're built in a way um, which can really take advantage of cloud services. So if you look at AWS, they don't just provide you with VMs, uh, but they can also provide you with load balances. If you look at Azure, they don't just provide you with VMs, they've got different kinds of storage. If you look at Google, they don't just provide you with VMs, they've got these ancillary SaaS services that they wrap around, which are, in each case, really interesting and really good. Right. So simultaneously, you want to do two things. First, you want to decouple your, your, your thinking about process containers, Kubernetes, Docker, from your choice of cloud. Because as a business, you want to maintain the freedom to choose. But if you've decided to deploy something on Azure, right, 
it makes sense to then get the most efficient deployment on Azure. If you've decided to deploy something on OpenStack, it makes sense to, to get the most efficient OpenStack. And if there are ancillary services that are kind of built into the cloud and cheap and super reliable, just things you don't have to worry about at that point, then binding into those and integrating with those things is really interesting, really, really useful, right? And that's something of a contradiction. I just said, you know, separate these choices. And then I said, having separated those choices, go and like lock yourself into the cloud, right? But in fact, if you think about it right, the fact that you can spin up a Kubernetes wherever you want and then optimize that Kubernetes for the cloud, you're not locked in, right? You, you, your developers shouldn't know which cloud you're on at that stage unless they themselves are choosing cloud-specific services for machine learning or other capabilities that those clouds are offering, right? At a Kate's level, at a Kubernetes level, you, know, you, sh you should be able to choose where you want to do something for a project and then choose if you want to use the local optimizations, the cloud-specific optimizations. So that we would call sort of integration of the cloud and Kubernetes. And then this is probably the biggest thing that most people don't think about, um, but maybe I hope you will, which is that, you know, you, you fall in love with a thing like Kubernetes, and it's very exciting. And so all of your best people will be interested in it. The CIO will be paying attention. The, you know, there'll be monthly metrics as to how big your cluster is or how many apps you've moved to it or how in production it is, right? But it really starts to pay value to the business, just like OpenStack, when you stop thinking about it in that, you know, in that, in that very kind of excited way. It really starts to pay for the business when infrastructure kind of disappears into the background so the business can focus on the things that are really unique to the business, right? So we saw this very much with OpenStack, right? OpenStack, you know, people couldn't get enough OpenStack and they were going to have their very, very best people on OpenStack and OpenStack was super important to the board and to the future of the company and blah, 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 right? And um, uh, now I think we're in a much healthier place that everybody says, geez, I just want an OpenStack that works. Right? What's happening is that everyday operations and costs are suddenly really starting to dominate the conversation. Right? Because at the end of the day, infrastructure is just infrastructure. Right? If the CIO is happy to buy disks from Amazon, it really tells you right, that at a CIO level, you know, what kind of disk it is doesn't really matter because you don't know when you're buying from Amazon. Right? I think that's super useful and super important to think about in the early stages. You're going to be living with this thing every day, and it will not be the most important thing, right? Hopefully it won't be the most important thing, because what should be the most important thing is the apps you're building on top of it, right? But it's an easy thing to lose sight of, because in the moment, containers, 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 it's super exciting, and everybody has opinions, right? So this is the, the one thing to remember, is that at the end of the day, the stuff should just fade into the background, should just disappear, should just be there, right? And so that you don't have to worry about it at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, but more importantly, so that it doesn't show up in a surprising way in the budget, right? At the end of the day, the stuff should be there at a reasonable level and, and, and never essentially deflect or constrain your, your, your other decisions. In a similar way, like these are all constraints about how you might think about operating Kubernetes. We know that open source has become the way that infrastructure gets defined, right? We understand that um, uh, we're living in a world where innovation, even mission critical corporate defining innovation, leaks out of the building. And in fact, in many cases, it's pushed out of the building as open source, right? And remember the good old days when open source, open source was a sort of side project from people who you know, had spare time at work. Um, today, in many cases, you know, critical things that companies are inventing gets pushed out onto GitHub before it's a product, right? And so, you know, we have to find new ways to think about how do you know that a product is going to be around for a long time, right? It used to be um, that, that uh, your enterprise database would get released every three years, and before it got released, it would have gone through 
very, very rigorous QA and documentation, um, you know, extensive beta testing and so on and so forth. And you could, you were essentially blind to all of that because it didn't exist to you until suddenly it showed up as a press release and a new product launch and so on and so forth, right? Whereas today, we literally watch the, we watch the guts of software development, right, in public. It's great. It's very exciting. It's the best time ever to be a software person, right? Because you literally get to watch Google, Microsoft, Oracle, and others do their R&D in public, right? And Kubernetes, OpenStack are no different, right? They, they're just, we get to watch all of this. But the flip side to that is, ugh, you know, it's a bit messy. Um, and the best way to be pretty confident that um, uh, uh, you, you will be able to go with the flow effectively is essentially to think carefully about places where you step out of the flow, where you step, where you climb out of the river effectively. And I think, you know, if we look at OpenStack over the last couple of years, there'd be many cases again where people stood up and said, you know, you should use our OpenStack because it has this particular feature, or we fixed this thing in OpenStack, or OpenStack had this problem and our OpenStack doesn't have that, right? And at the time, that might have sounded very convincing and compelling. But in the long run, you know, come back to the previous one. In the long run, there's no single feature you might have had on Kilo, which turns out to be more valuable than everything you could get in L, M, N, and Okata, right? And so staying close to upstream is really the best way to say, look, there may be one thing right now that's super, super, super attractive and interesting, but if I, stay, if I essentially preserve my ability to upgrade, right, I'm going to get a thousand new things every six months. And actually, as a business, um, getting into those features isn't the most important thing for the business. One of our, so you saw in the keynotes today, the big focus on managed services. And um, I, I think they talked about one of the world's biggest deployments, large-scale deployments of multiple OpenStack clouds moving to a fully managed service. That's actually Canonical's Bootstack service. Um, uh, and the customer there essentially said, hey, you know, um, in the early stages of OpenStack, we fell in love with the idea of modifying it. We fell in love with the idea that we ourselves could essentially change it and modify it. Now we have a bunch of them, and we're not exactly sure how they've been modified, right? And we're not exactly sure, right, which modifications are where, and we're not exactly sure, right, what will break if we upgrade to newer versions of those OpenStack. So the project essentially is to help them put the economics of operating OpenStack into a box so that it becomes super, super predictable, right? But really, thinking about staying close to upstream is thinking about all of those things. There's nothing wrong with investing in patches for OpenStack, but essentially consuming them as part of the main release cycle is a much healthier way. And really, as, a, as an operation, the key question is to think about, how am I going to upgrade, right? How am I going to upgrade? It still amazes me today, went through an RFP process, and as we started that RFP process, it became clear that in the waiting of how the company was thinking about OpenStack, technology was 35%. And I think that's quite smart, right? At the end of the day, OpenStack is maturing. Um, so pretty much all of the distributions are going to offer the same sort of technology. Um, uh, economics are much, much more important, right? If you think of why a business is even bothering to do OpenStack, it's to give themselves the option of owning infrastructure alongside renting infrastructure. Smart businesses will do both, right? So they want to give themselves this option. If you ignore economics, you're forgetting the real reason to do OpenStack at all, right? It's all about economics. But anyway, 35% of the weight was for technology, but of that, only 8%, uh, if you treated the, all the tech as 100%, only 8%, less than a tenth, was can you upgrade? Well, that's really crazy, right? Because if you think about it, if you're rolling out for a large business, you may be rolling out tens or hundreds of clouds. If you think of a telco, you're rolling out 200 clouds in North America. Well, if you do one a day, by the time you get to the end of that, right, you're two releases out of date of OpenStack. So actually, not only do you need to roll them out one a day, you need to upgrade them effectively every six months, which means you may have to upgrade them twice in the same year before you've finished rolling out the whole thing, right? So upgrades, your ability to own the thing and upgrade the thing, and to do all of that predictably and cheaply, those turned out to be 
super, super valuable, right? So in your weightings of things, you know, staying close to upstream and everyday costs turn out to be super, super important. Any comments or questions? Anyone want to call me out for a lying, cheating, thieving South African? Is this resonating with those of you who've owned OpenStack for a little while? Yes. It's very pertinent. So the question is, you know, when you're upgrading something that has many, many moving parts, how do you assure stability? I'd say the, the, the number one, the deep, the zen of how is repetition. You know, the first time you upgrade anything complicated, it is a science project, right? And that's true of everybody, right? You might have, you know, a better background in physics, but it's still a science project. And the great thing about science is, you learn stuff because it doesn't work quite the way you thought it was going to work, right? So the, the real key is, is essentially using the same upgrade process that many other people have used because you find that there are rough edges and, and if lots of people have used that process, then other people will have found rough edges that you don't have to find. So that's the first thing. For us, one of the keys is that we're able to essentially reuse operations code in completely different architectures. Now, normally, if you think about how people automate stuff, they'll say, oh, we're automated. And this, you know, the bank will say, we're totally automated. And the building, you know, the other guys will say, the insurance guys will say, we're totally automated. And the, the oil and gas guys will say, we're totally automated. But if you look at them, there's not a single line of Chef or Puppet or Salt or Ansible that's the same in those two operations. Or if they started with the same thing once upon a time, they've forked beyond recognition, which means for each of them, the first time they do it, it's a science project, right? So we have a substantial advantage because of our use of Juju, which essentially encapsulates operations and decouples those from architecture. We can use the same operations code even in cases where you have two completely different architectures of OpenStack. You know, I might, for whatever reason, have storage and compute and, uh, and control plane all on the same machines with or without containers. And somebody else may have said, no, 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 no. I've got reasons that I want to separate those things. Two totally different architectures. But the code that sequences, what do I tell this hypervisor node before I tell that control plane node, before I tell this database node, before I tell that messaging node, that code can all be the same because that's independent of architecture, right? The operations of the Oracle database, it's a good idea to sequence this, then this, then this, then this when you're backing it up and updating it. Those are independent of whether those things are VMs or physical machines or even containers, right? So, so the, the key thing actually came from, from pulling operations out of the architectural automation. It, we call that modeling, right? We, the, the architecture comes from the model, but the operations are essentially reusable across all different architectures and different models. So, so that's the heart of it. You know, it, people measure their progress in different ways. One of the things that we measure very closely is for our customers, um, how many of them are on the latest version of OpenStack? It's really important to us to help them that they're just there on the latest version of OpenStack. And it's very, very clear the difference between us and others is that our guys tend to find it fairly easy to stay on the latest version of OpenStack. They upgrade running clouds. The actual workloads don't need to know. Um, in fact, some of our toughest customers are now pushing to be able to maintain operations on the cloud. In other words, you're still creating disks, you're still creating VMs, you're still while you're actually upgrading those services. So that's the kind of current state of the art for us is, is being able to not only leave all the workloads in place and then upgrade the cloud you know, in, in, in a couple of minutes, but actually to be able to leave the cloud operating so that you don't have, you have essentially zero downtime from the point of view of things that are consuming resources. That's super fun, actually. That's super fun getting to that level of operations. Um, but okay, the key thing is to be able to reuse that knowledge easily across, across lots and lots of people so that it's not a science project for everybody, right? Let, let somebody else push us to do the R&D so that, so that everyone else can reuse it for free. Okay, so now the question, how do we think OpenStack and Kubernetes fit together? Well, the simplistic answer is beautifully, right? Like the, the, they are effectively dealing with different 
classes of object in, in my view. And it's not up to me to say what OpenStack is, right? There's a board for OpenStack and they make decisions and technical committees and then PTLs and projects and tents and things like that. That's where OpenStack gets defined. But if you would ask me, I would simply say, look, we have two completely separate and independent layers, right? We have machines on demand as a story. And for that, we need software and APIs and things that give us machines on demand. And at some level, everybody knows what a machine is, right? I mean, it's kind of the beauty, what Amazon did is they said, here, you can have a machine by the hour. Is it an actual machine? No, it's a virtual machine, but we don't care, right? It feels, looks like a duck, talks like a duck, quacks like a duck. We can use it like a duck, right? And we can certainly do R&D or prototyping for ducks on that kind of stuff, right? And everybody was quite happy with that, and now people do a lot more, right? So we have infrastructure for machines on demand, and then we have infrastructure for processes on demand, and those can stay completely independent. Now, it's up to OpenStack to have the kind of clarity of purpose to not be confused about that, right? And maybe we will, maybe we won't, but I'm not confused about that, and I suggest you not be confused about that because the confusion won't help, right? You want to be able to do Kubernetes trivially on OpenStack or on public cloud the same way. That means it can't be something special to do with OpenStack. There is an opportunity, I think, to, do, to provide services in OpenStack and bind those to Kubernetes when people do choose to put their standard Kubernetes on OpenStack. And the services there would be Elbaz, for example. Elbaz, to me, makes a lot of sense to have as essentially part of the broader picture of Neutron. And we already see Elbaz. Um, it's, it's, it's well defined. The couplings between Elbaz and Kubernetes are very obvious. The way Kubernetes thinks about an application is as a set of processes with IP addresses across which you can load balance, right? So they're very clear examples of places where should OpenStack provide a standard infrastructure as a service primitive, a Kubernetes could bind to that and use it as an optimization. But, but that's it. As far as OpenStack is concerned, it doesn't know that that's Kubernetes, right? That's just a set of IP addresses that it's load balancing across. So processes on demand, that's what Kubernetes does very well, but it's also what, what Docker does very well. Machines on demand, think of three classes of machines, physical machines, and for that we recommend Metal as a Service, MAS. It's very widely adopted. In fact, if you're playing a computer game these days, almost certainly the server that you're talking to was deployed with MAS. Like people who are deploying tens of thousands of machines and they want to do that super reliably, super efficiently, and they just want to move 500 machines from this game to that game this morning and this afternoon they might move another 500 machines depending on what gamers are doing they would use MAS, right? It's just physical machines on demand. Virtual machines on demand, that is really the domain of OpenStack. Like there is, when it's done well, when it's done properly, there is nothing that can beat the economics, even if you take it as a managed service like Bootstack, right? There's nothing that can beat the economics for VMs, virtual disks, and virtual networks on demand uh, that, than OpenStack, if you're okay with CapEx. You know what I mean, CapEx? Buying, buying servers and data centers. Some people aren't okay with that. Public cloud obviously suits them. Large organizations should do both, right? But for your on-prem infrastructure, there's nothing that can beat OpenStack. And then uh, containers. So in the world of containers, just to, just to confuse things a little, you can take a, the container idea and take it all the way to the point where it looks like a VM. Now this is not what Docker does, right? Docker essentially says they're only interested in just opening up the container enough to fit one process in. And actually that's super useful because it, it gives us a very clean way to ship that one process, right? But um, other people, and Canonical in particular, we're interested in essentially extending that idea to have a container that feels like a virtual machine. In other words, it, you know, if you just logged into it, if you SSH to it, it could be CentOS and you wouldn't know that it wasn't CentOS, right? Um, and so I call that like, containers for legacy workloads or containers for old people, right? It's, it's a, a really interesting conversation because simultaneously we will talk to a bank about Docker or Kubernetes, which is the new style process container cloud native architecture for the next applications, and LexD, which is basically where can you substitute out KVM for something that's lighter and faster but without changing the application, right? So 
You can get machines that are containers, but don't worry too much about that, right? It doesn't, it's not Kubernetes, it's just machines. And then on top of that, processes, the way you organize larger numbers of processes, you can use Docker Swarm, you can use Kubernetes, but for here, obviously the thing that we're focused on is Kubernetes. Across all of these different places, you can get machines, right? You can get machines from Google. I can get machines from OpenStack. I can get machines from Oracle, Rackspace, software. It is kind of fantastic that you have all of those guys working for you, right? Oracle will give you a machine on demand. That's great. So will Google, so will Microsoft, so will Amazon. And so really thinking about then how to deliver Kubernetes cleanly on that is, is the story of the day. Oops. So I have, let's see what I've got that's fun. Let's not go there yet. So um, I'm going to need to, unsuspend this. This is a box uh, from a Canadian company called Contron. It has nine physical nodes in a 2U form factor, so it's pretty amazing. And I understand that they actually built it for Telco NFV, because essentially you can just drop OpenStack straight onto that. Uh, people who know Canonical will know that that's just Maz, and I'm showing the Maz dashboard over there, plus a Juju bundle that Contron have designed of an OpenStack that fits perfectly, so it's literally one command to put an OpenStack on there. But for today's purposes, let's rather put uh, Kubernetes on there. So if I say Juju status, um, I have a blank model. I'm a, bit, I'm a bit nervous about all the machines turning on and off when I'm not doing anything. Maybe they're just sleeping. Um, uh, and I want to say Juju deploy Kubernetes core. And so with a little bit of luck, what am I doing? I'm building a model. So I'm reusing those operations of Kubernetes. And our Kubernetes core is a sort of pre-canned bundle of the simplest possible Kubernetes that you might put together. And with a little f help from the internet. There we go, it'll come. Um, I'm building a model of this super simple Kubernetes. And I'm mapping that model to a couple of physical machines. So what you should see is physical machines turning on. And then once those machines have the operating systems installed, the model of the Kubernetes applications will be built, and that will give me uh, a Kubernetes. It's going out to the internet for each kind of chunk, each part of the topology. So it's going out to fetch Kubernetes, all the pieces of Kubernetes. Um, so I'm going to leave that and just switch to the public cloud. Um, this is a, a slightly bigger model of Kubernetes that I deployed on Google um, an hour ago. And so I can just kind of walk you through that. So I typed exactly the same command. Instead of just Kubernetes core, I chose uh, canonical Kubernetes, right? And so that's a slightly bigger model. In other words, it has some additional pieces and it scales out some of those pieces. So let's just look at what's in that Kubernetes. Uh, oh, we're slightly cropped on the screen, but essentially we've got um, uh, that the heart of it is Kubernetes master and worker. And for Kubernetes core, that's what you'll see. That's the architecture of Kubernetes. Essentially there's a controller and then the work gets distributed across a set of machines. There's an agent on each machine. That's the worker effectively. And, and those will be glued together. Etcd from core OS is used as a database, essentially keep track of what's been put where. Um, we use a key distribution system called EZRSA, so that essentially is like a little certificate authority, hands out keys um, to each of those pieces so that when they connect to each other, they understand who's doing what. And then Flannel is a way of essentially describing um, uh, uh, encrypted network tunnels to those different workers so that they can talk to each other um, in a secure fashion. So we can give IP addresses effectively to all of those pieces. In this model, um, it's built out over a bunch of different machines, and so you can see we've actually got multiple of the Kubernetes workers, because that's fun, it's elastic, we can just grow more of those, um, and three of the etcds, so that's a, essentially a full production etcd. Um, and so everyday operations, say I've got a, a Kubernetes on the public cloud, this one's running on Google. Uh, it's not currently, but we are working with Google to bind this to the Google capabilities if you want, right? So I just used the standard topology here, but what we want to do is, is address that question about binding to the features of the cloud. 
And I can deploy exactly the same thing, exactly the same way on, uh, on Azure, and then add the features to bind to their load balancers as a service or their storage primitives, for example. But say, for example, I wanted to scale this out, I could just say, I want to add three units to Kubernetes worker. So because I've mutated the model, essentially, I've now said, okay, I actually want a total of six units of Kubernetes worker, and that means I need to go out and get another three machines from Google, which are pending. So you can read that chart very clearly. You can see how changing the model essentially fetches clouds from resources from the cloud as needed. How are we doing on that bare metal? So you saw the deploy. And here, because it was Kubernetes core, I've actually only got, well, really, two physical machines that I'm asking for. So Kubernetes core, you can do Kubernetes core with just two VMs or just two physical machines. And then all of those services are mapped in there. And they'll be busy turning on um, to get the operating system deployed. If I go and have a look at that in MAS, here you'll see there are those two machines, and they've gone from switched off to turned on. The operating system's getting deployed, and then the model of Kubernetes will get built on top of that. OK, so now I want to do something a little crazy. Um, that Google Kubernetes is in the middle of a big change. I scaled it out, right? So I'm in the middle of scaling out that Kubernetes. And I deployed that Kubernetes, and I deliberately asked for an old version of Kubernetes. Right? I deliberately asked for Kubernetes 1.5. Who's played with Kubernetes? Who's actually built it? How many of you built with 1.5? How many of you built with 1.6? OK. So this is a classic problem. People go out, Kubernetes changes every three months. And so people will go out and build with Kubernetes 1.5 and then 1.6 ships. And then how much work is it to go and replumb that infrastructure and so on and so forth? How stuck do you get? Well, I'll show you. When you do it this way, I'll show you how stuck you get. So say I want to upgrade Kubernetes 1.5 to Kubernetes 1.6. Well, I actually only have two pieces of Kubernetes here that I need to worry about, right? Um, so here in Google, I've got the Kubernetes master and worker, and I'm going to just go juju config. Um, Kubernetes master. And I'm going to switch, tell it to change a config item which tells it to switch its uh, channel. So I'm done. That will trigger through Juju, through the model, that will then trigger all of the work on the right VMs to, to upgrade the control plane to 1.6. The work is, I can do the same thing, but uh, so let me just do a status that. Okay. So it goes, it goes down very, uh, what's down is the machine from Google. Remember, I'm in the middle of that expansion. So I'm busy growing this cluster from three units to six units. And while I'm doing that, I'm busy upgrading. Just, just to give you a sense of what it feels like when you're operating in this great way. So um, I've upgraded the master. I now want to go and upgrade the workers. And so you'll see an interesting thing. It will say blocked. So I'm upgrading Kubernetes worker. And if I go to status, it's going to change. And they're going to say that they're blocked, the ones that are up. Right. Now, why are they blocked? Because to go from 1.5 and 1.6 on the worker, I have to restart the process. It's like there was a version 1.5 of the process. I have to turn it off and turn on the 1.6 of the process. But the way these process containers work, restarting that or killing that is going to kill all of the workloads, all of the things that it started. So I don't want to shotgun that. I don't want to simultaneously. I, I changed the config. I changed the model. I said I want 1.6 across all the workers. But I actually want to control the process. Now, I can just put it into shotgun mode. It's just an option, and then it'll just do it. But it's much more interesting to see uh, the process of doing it this way. Um, if we, so what we do is in the, in the Juju framework, we have the ability to have um, operational actions, which you can then deliver to specific units. So now if I go and I say, right, I want to do an upgrade action just on Kubernetes worker zero, that gets queued off. It's asynchronous. And if I go and look at the status, in a little while, you'll see now it's doing the, now it's essentially Preparing for the 
upgrade action. And I think it's now doing that. And very shortly it will be done. So you see how I can now control the rollout of the upgrade across that. Now if you show, like there are lots of the biggest Kubernetes are on Ubuntu. Uh, the Microsoft Azure Kubernetes, for example, that service is on Ubuntu. Um, the eBay and other, some of the larger corporate users of Kubernetes are on Ubuntu. Um, and for the folks who've actually gotten deep into this and sweated with the chef and the puppet needed to stand up Kubernetes at scale, this is amazing. This is magic. When they see it, they say, ah, now I understand why you guys do it in that way. So how are we doing on time? Do we, we're at the top of the hour. Okay, I'm going to take questions, but while I take questions, my colleague James is going to come in and plug in and just essentially do that deploy on top of OpenStack in the background. Sorry, James. James has a very good speaking voice and answers questions quite well too. But, <laughs> but if, if anybody has questions, I'll take them while James essentially just shows you a stand-up of Kubernetes on OpenStack. So now you would have seen Kubernetes getting stood up on bare metal. You'd have seen it getting stood up on Google and then upgraded on Google while it was being scaled out on Google. And then we'll show you the same on OpenStack. So complete decoupling of those two. Any questions? Was that useful? Yeah. yeah. Any questions? How is Maz related to Ironic? How's Maz related to Ironic? Maz is something of a uh, wise old grandfather to Ironic. It's probably the nicest way to put it. So Maz predates OpenStack and is now used very widely to operate the whole data center. Folks, there was a an opinion fest, and there were folks who said, no, they wanted bare metal, in, bare metal provisioning inside OpenStack, effectively. We disagreed with that simply because we thought, look, most of OpenStack is to give you virtual machines, virtual disks, virtual networks. Most of the knobs and dials on the dashboard are complete lies or irrelevant when you're dealing with physical hardware. So we continued with MAS, and now I think most people agree that actually it's better to give your data center to MAS and then use um, uh, uh, OpenStack for virtual goods. If you want bare metal performance with OpenStack, the best way to do it is with containers. Remember I showed you that kind of container, LexD, that is like a machine. So OpenStack LexD, Nova LexD is great. And so if you give people a single container on bare metal through OpenStack, then it feels like real OpenStack and they get all the raw, raw performance of the machine. So yes, we see a lot of folks who asked that question, less so now, because I think people have tried both, they generally go with Maz. Other questions? Yes. Yes, quite a few of our customers are interested in things like Kala or OpenStack Helm. You can find uh, official canonical images for, open, uh, for can, you know, canonical Kala on, on Docker Hub. Um, and, and we will happily support our customers if that's, if that's how they want to do it. You could juju deploy Kubernetes at scale on Maz and then run Kala or OpenStack Helm to spin up Kubernetes on top of that. It does, to me, feel like a little bit uh, like a hammer in search of a nail. Um, I think um, uh, we will support customers who go down that route, but most of our customers have said actually Juju plus Maz gives them really beautiful OpenStack operations at scale and they'll wait for other people to polish off the rough edges on other approaches before they go there. Okay, I've got the uh, tricky bit of connecting to the screen done. So uh, this is a, a, a Carter-based cloud running on Ubuntu 16.04. Uh, it's one we actually run all of our QA for Ubuntu and for the OpenStack Charms project on. Uh, you can see I've got a couple of instances running. I've got a Juju controller already running, and uh, we're going to deploy the same bundle that Mark deployed on uh, GCE on, on this cloud as well. So that's so exactly very the experience. same command that I typed to deploy on the Google public cloud effectively. Mm. And what we should see once this has started going is... Uh, just let it get its legs. So we're now talking to the Juju controller and saying, hey, we want to build a model which has these apps and these VMs on OpenStack. The Juju controller will then turn around to OpenStack and say, hey, we need some VMs. And hopefully those will start showing up in the Nova listing in a sec. Good. Last question. Yes. Yeah. Is there any effort going in to make mass like compatible with Kubernetes so that Kubernetes can directly deploy the container on the mass 
Yes, you can. I mean, so lots of people use Maz without Juju. They use Maz just to own the data center and allocate machines to Windows, allocate machines to CentOS, allocate machines to Ubuntu. Maz will deploy all of those things, and Maz has no idea whether it's giving them to Juju, whether it's giving them to Ansible, whether it's giving them to Chef, Puppet, anything else. So it's very easy to just get machines out of Maz through a REST API, right? If they're in your quota, you can get them, right? Uh, and so that makes it easy. Well, K Kubernetes is, <laughs> Kubernetes will give you Docker processes on demand, right? You're, you're kind of making life difficult for the Kubernetes people if you start asking them to give you physical machines on demand, right? Everything has a Zen. Everything has its purpose, right? There are chisels and hammers and mallets and they're all good. Do you know what I mean? You want to use things the way they're good. So Kates will give you Docker processes on demand. Maz will give you physical machines on demand, right? Those are each different things. What you can do is you could use, for example, Ansible and Bash or Python to deploy Ubuntu across a bunch of machines or CentOS across, across a bunch of machines and then put Kubernetes on top of that. You would just be doing for yourself manually the stuff that Juju does for you, right? So really, don't be ideological about this would be my thoughtful advice, right? Good. Thank you very much. I hope that was useful. Thank you. Thank you. Did they come up?